In October, Craig McIver, formerly a director at the New York office of the U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights, left his post. He protested that the U.N. was, quote, failing in its duty to prevent what he called a textbook case of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. He also accused the U.S., the U.K., and much of Europe of being, quote, wholly complicit in this horrific assault. Today, we'll speak to Mokhyber about the utility of the U.N. at a time like this. We'll also talk about what's at stake for the future of Palestine. Craig, I want to thank you for joining me on up front. Good to be here. Last Friday, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordered the population of Gaza's Rafah district uh, to be evacuated ahead of an expected ground invasion. Now, Amnesty International Secretary General warned that civilians in Gaza were at, quote, grave risk of genocide in response to Israel's order. Uh, at this point, Israel's killed over 28,000 Palestinians, and likely more, because many people are still lost in the rubble. Uh, it's now been nearly four months since you left your post at the UN in protest. Uh, how is it that months later, they're still not doing much, if anything, uh, to stop this assault? Well, I think it's because the fundamental dynamics that I and others warned about all the way back in October have not changed. Israel operates under a climate of absolute impunity. That is because uh, the activities of Israel in Gaza and elsewhere are underwritten by the United States, by the United Kingdom, by much of Europe, as I indicated in my letter. And that has not changed very significantly. We've seen a wholesale slaughter uh, in Gaza, wholesale destruction of civilian infrastructure in Gaza, starting from the north and working its way south. And now you have half the population literally up against the fence in Rafa, the southernmost town in all of Gaza, and poised to be the next target in this ongoing massacre and, as I've said, this ongoing genocide. And until those dynamics change, until states begin to respect their international obligations, until international organizations stop fearing powerful member states like the United States, uh, it's not going to change at the international level either. Let's talk about some of those arrangements, specifically with the powerful member states that you mentioned. You spoke about how the U.S., the U.K., and other Western countries have such a, an extraordinary influence over what Israel does. Uh, they give them the arms, they give them the economic support, and they give them diplomatic cover. I mean, if, if you think about Israel uh, and its treatment at the U.N. Security Council, the U.S. abstains, they veto, they do all the things necessary to provide diplomatic cover for Israel. Uh, you served the U.N. for over 30 years. Uh, in your view, is the U.N. even capable of being more than an extension or a tool of Western interests? Well, to the extent that the U.N. functions as an extension of Western power, the U.N. should not exist. Uh, because the U.N. was set up... The U.N. should not exist. To the extent that it functions as an instrument of Western power, it should mm. not exist. But there's this tension in the U.N. You know, the U.N. was set up as a normative institution, as a constitutional institution. It was supposed to be about international law, international human rights, the peaceful resolution of disputes, international development cooperation. But there was another side of the UN, the political side of the House, that is not interested in full respect for those norms and standards of international law that are more involved in a kind of deference to power. And, you know, UN officials and UN uh, offices that sort of triangulate where the power is are always going to weigh in favor of oppression and not in favor of their mission, of their mandate. And the people who are on the front lines in the UN, the humanitarian workers, the human rights defenders, the more than 150 UNRWA workers who've been murdered by Israeli bombs and bullets in the course of the last few months, those are heroic defenders of the norms and standards of the organization. But they've been abandoned by the political leadership. And they've been abandoned by some of the intergovernmental bodies. We all know the story of the Security Council, which has been rendered absolutely impotent by the US veto in this circumstance. And every time the U.S. has vetoed a ceasefire, thousands more of innocent civilians have died in, uh, in Gaza. There, you have a challenge of massive institutional reform. But that is not the case with regard to the political leadership. There is nothing stopping senior U.N. political leaders from speaking truth to power. And I would argue it is their job to do so, that when it is a question of the violation of the norms and standards of the organization, it is their job to speak up and to call a spade a spade. In this case, to say out loud words like apartheid, words like genocide. They haven't been willing to do that. Is the decision not to say genocide or apartheid uh, 
simply f political cowardice, or is there some other strategic or reasonable legal calculation there, i.e., the courts decide what's genocide, not us. Let the ICJ decide that. Let the ICC decide that. In order for the UN to be above the fray, we can't get involved in, in those types of, of judgments. It is political cowardice, and I'll tell you why. The UN is capable and has in the past aligned its positions with its own norms and standards. Think about apartheid in South Africa. The UN maintained a principled law-based position on behalf of equality, international human rights, and international law until apartheid fell in South Africa. In Palestine, 30 years ago, they abandoned that position in favor of an amorphous political project where somewhere down the road there is a promise of a two-state solution, which became a smokescreen behind which we saw continued persecution, dispossession, massive and systematic violations of human rights, and leading now to genocide. It is true that only a court can determine whether or not it is genocide in the final instance. But the Convention of the UN on Genocide uh, uh, mandates not just genocide, but also mandates the prevention of genocide. And the UN is willing to speak out when it sees torture, war crimes, even crimes against humanity, without waiting for a court decision. When the crime of crimes is being committed, you cannot wait until the dust is settled and the blood has dried to even utter the word genocide. This is a classic, as I've said, textbook case of genocide. What, what makes if there's this no text, red line what makes here, this textbook? there is no red line. What, what makes it textbook? Because there are people who will say, well, South Africa was very, very clear. Uh, other incidents, Rwanda, Cambodia, we, we could look in places and say these are indisputable black and white issues, whereas with Israel, it's complex. That's the favorite word used. This is complex. How do you respond to people who say, well, you know, the story here isn't as simple as, uh, as, as Israel's committing genocide. Even October 7th itself stands as an example of a war crime being committed against Israel and Israel's responding. That's what folks say. What do you say to them? Well, it's not so complex. I think that is a rhetorical device that's used to avoid looking clearly at the situation as it is on the ground. And this is the sin also of the United Nations. They're willing to talk about humanitarian aid. They're willing to talk about even a ceasefire. But they're not willing to talk about the root causes. They're not willing to talk about settler colonialism. They're not willing to talk about apartheid. Only in the case of Israel and Palestine are they afraid to even talk about the root causes and instead talk about an eventual two-state solution. That's not going to solve the conflict. The, the only solution to the conflict, of course, is a situation in which we have equal rights for Christians, Muslims, Jews, and others. But nobody's willing to talk about that. So I think that's a real cop-out. I think it explains why this has continued for 76 years now uh, and why current efforts at ending even a, gen uh, a genocidal assault are not going to be effective. And, Mark, you know, the other thing that's not complex is genocide. I was addressing this as an international human rights lawyer, and according to the language of the Genocide Convention, according to international jurisprudence, there's no question that the two main elements of genocide, genocidal intent and acts of genocide as defined in the Convention, have been manifest here. And in particular, when you have a situation where the leadership of Israel, political and military, the president, the prime minister, at least seven cabinet ministers, the, the military leadership themselves have openly, publicly, repeatedly declared genocidal intent. You, you have to take them at their word. It's not complex. It's genocide. It's interesting, right? You are making a very compelling case that Israel is given an almost protected status in these bodies. And then you talk to Israel, and Israel says the UN has it in for us. The UN focuses almost exclusively on us. Uh, Israel's Minister of Energy uh, accused UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres of supporting Hamas and endorsing the, quote, murder of the elderly, the abduction of babies, and the rape of women on October 7th. War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz also labeled the UN chief a, quote, terror apologist. How do you... How can we reconcile those two things? Well, because there are two UNs. There is the UN, as I was describing, which is based upon international law, and that UN is a form in which Israel cannot win because it is in violation of all of the norms and standards of the organization, because of dispossession, because of apartheid, because of institutionalized discrimination, because of persecution, because of settlement activity. Uh, all of these are violations of international law. But there's another side of the UN, the one that I am criticizing, which is the political leadership of the UN and some of the more trepidatious or compromised intergovernmental bodies. Those are the sides of the UN that ignore those norms and standards, that ignore international law, and defer to the power of the United States, the United Kingdom, Europe, sometimes other 
uh, other major powers. And the frustration that Israeli leaders are expressing is that they don't get impunity when the norms and standards are applied, but they know they have an audience for impunity when it comes to the political leadership. And they know as well in recent years that they have built up a network of Israel lobby groups that are specifically focused on persecuting, attacking, smearing UN officials and UN mechanisms that dare to speak out against Israeli atrocities. And that that also suppresses um, uh, an honest commentary, you know, the willingness to speak truth to power by senior UN officials. So those are two UNs. They are in tension. They are in tension. But the, 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 the UN that is simply a, an expression of the political power of the West is not a UN that the world needs. What the world needs is the promise of the UN that the world would be governed by the rule of law, by international law and by international human rights. There's also a very pragmatic and practical UN. That's the UN that is providing life-saving humanitarian assistance. That's the UN that's making sure that Palestinian refugees have some possibility of resettlement, that they have right now hospitals and, and housing and, 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 and all the stuff that UNRWA, for example, provides. If the UN, in many ways, is the last stopgap for them, is there any danger, tactically speaking, of being so critical of them right now? You already got Israel doing it from the other side. If you're critical of, of the UN from your vantage point, do we run the risk of, as a practical matter, undermining uh, the chance of Palestinians getting assistance? Well, that's why I'm always very careful to distinguish between the parts of the UN that I am criticizing. I mean, UNRWA, for example, which has been absolutely heroic and has paid the highest cost for 150 plus of its uh, staff members murdered in this, uh, in this genocide, exists because of a denial of the rights and self-determination of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people don't want to rely upon UNRWA, but they must because, remember, the people in Gaza were already refugees from inside what is now Israel. They were purged from their homes on the basis of their ethnicity through massacres and attacks and forced into Gaza, where they have had to rely upon a UN agency for education, for health care, for housing, for, uh, for survival, right? And, so, and that's, that's exactly why Israel is attacking UNRWA uh, with its repeated, disingenuous, false, bogus claims uh, about wrongdoing on the part of UNRWA. And imagine, Mark, even if a couple of people participated in some crimes, even if that were the case, that is not an indictment of UNRWA. UNRWA has 13,000 staff in Gaza, 30,000 staff uh, overall. If you made a list of people who worked for the U.S. government who have committed crimes, would that mean then that the U.S. government uh, needs to be uh, dismantled? Um, it's, it's an absurd claim uh, in, in every direction. First, because there's no evidence that anyone has committed a crime. And secondly, that even if they did, that's not an indictment of UNRWA. The real purpose here is the destruction of UNRWA because it's in the way of the destruction of the Palestinian people. Craig McIver, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thank you, Mark, for having me.